you all hear me? Yes. All right, good. Well, I want to do a round of thank yous, too. Thanks to Mike. When I grow up, I want to rock the mic like Mike Williams. Guy knows how to command a mic. And I love the library. Central Library is like one of my top three favorite places in Indy. And uh, thanks to Brittany. I don't know if you all know, but Brittany is like the most encouraging person in the world. And I'm like the worst person to work with. I'm always like two weeks late and like pushing it at the last minute. And she's been so encouraging and uh, supportive to me. And also thank you to Annika Larson, because I think in some way she is uh, part of the reason why I'm here. I taught a journalism class at IUPUI, International Mass Media, which is basically a chance for me to play music from West Africa and talk about colonialism. So um, Annika uh, saw me do my thing in class and said for some reason uh, to somebody that we ought to get this guy in front of more people. So here I am. Uh, thank you very much. I want to start out by uh, practicing what I preach, and you'll understand a little bit later what I'm talking about. Um, oh, a name lesson. My name is Kiel, like even Kiel. Um, my last name, true Polish way, is Majewski. J makes a Y sound. If you're like Hoosier, it's Majewski, Majewski, Majewoski, Major Switch, whatever. <laughs> uh, so just give it a good run. You know, names are important, but give it a good run. Um, I'm gonna, this is my most treasured possession. And I keep it in my right pocket all the time. And so I'm going to try and practice what I preach and give it to you guys. So if you could, uh, I'm going to give it to my man Ty here. And uh, if you want to, just pass it around. And by the time it makes it to uh, you know, the front row, no matter where I am in my little talk here, you can just come up and hand it back to me. I'll be good to uh, get it back. But uh, I'll tell you why this is important to me. Um, but as you, uh, you know, just feel it and uh, pass it around, you know, kind of inject your good vibes into it, and then we'll all be connected in that way. So you'll see on the patch when you get it, it's a timber wolf. And uh, I just started a little consulting shop in Madison, Wisconsin, where I've recently moved, called Timberwolf Advisors LLC. And the name comes from my grandfather's army outfit, the 104th Infantry Division, also known as the Timberwolf Division. So he was in the army during World War II, uh, he died before I was born, so I never got a chance to ask him all those questions you might want to ask. Um, but I was doing a research project uh, for this museum called Candles, Candles Holocaust Museum. Has anybody heard of it? It's in Terre Haute, which is weird to have a Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute, and there's a whole story there which we probably don't have time for today. But uh, Candles was firebombed. In 2003, totally destroyed, hate crime sort of thing, white supremacist. And um, the lady who founded the place is a, an Auschwitz survivor named Eva Kor. She's like, you know, four foot something. And people think she's a sweet little old lady, but she's not. She's like a bulldozer, and she'll like plow through you if you're in her way, you know. Uh, so I was an undergrad at Indiana State. I was doing a research project. Um, to make an exhibit for the museum after it reopened. And I was researching a guy who was in a liberating battalion. That is, he went into a concentration camp and helped to um, free the, the prisoners who were there, help them get home, that sort of thing. And I found out in the course of that research that my grandfather was in the exact same all the way down to the battalion as this guy was researching. So boom, big moment of history unlocked. My concept of history changed because I'd previously thought like textbooks, right? Like bold names like uh, Hitler, Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, stuff like that. But history is like those photo mosaics of you know, Bob Marley or Jesus or somebody, which is the big photo made up of all the little photos. And my grandfather's uh, picture was one of those photos, uh, one of those uh, parts of the story. The big shape of the Holocaust is partly informed by my grandfather's story. And he came back from the war with, I'm sure, PTSD, all these sorts of things that nobody was treating back then. And all of that trauma just gets passed down through the generations. It just reverberates. So uh, I started working for this museum because um, I'm the type of guy who, uh, E.B. White had a quote. He said, I wake up every morning determined to both change the world and have a hell of a good time, which makes planning the day kind of difficult. So that's the same approach that I take. 
And I started working for this museum. I thought, um, you know, I was the first uh, full-time employee. I can do something with this. And uh, it's beshert. It's a Hebrew word for meant to be. Uh, not good or bad necessarily, just meant to be. And I'm um, trying to figure out now what to do with all of these stories of survivors. I've spent 10 years working alongside genocide survivors, not just Eva Kaur, but other Holocaust survivors, people from Rwanda, Darfur, Burma, DR Congo, all these different places. And uh, it occurs to me they have some very valuable things to teach us, sometimes in spite of themselves. Um, why should we be concerned about survival? Well, first of all, there may be someone in this room right now who's going through the most difficult period of his or her life and maybe need some strategies or, or some encouragement or something like that. But then there's also some uh, budding genetic basis of evidence for uh, intergenerational inherited trauma. You know, we all kind of suffer the wounds of existence. <clears throat> I was um, talking to the fellow who was uh, helping serve coffee and he was talking about his kids and how often they fall and uh, you know, get right back up and all these sorts of things. But we have all these things that happen to us when we're kids. Uh, people say things to us, bully us, do whatever, and we absorb what we can call the wounds of existence. And that influences how we go about our world. So I wanted to uh, organize this talk around two dimensions. First is the personal dimension of survival. And then second would be the collective dimension. Uh, how do we survive as a movement? How do we survive as a people? So uh, with the personal dimension, um, I think the question is, what do we do when disaster strikes? And uh, disaster, if you break down the word, it's disaster. Aster is rooted in the word star. Dis means it's broken apart. Something broke apart your star. You're shattered. The pieces are on the floor. You've got to put yourself back together again. And the cure for a disaster, one of them, I think, is to remember. Literally, remember. Put the pieces back together and integrate it into your life. Um, people, I would say that uh, one thing that I've seen, Eva Kaur, for example, opened up Candles Holocaust, Memorial, uh, Candles Holocaust Museum and Education Center in memory of her twin sister. They were twins in Auschwitz. They were being experimented on uh, by this guy, Joseph Mengele, 10-year-old kids um, who were at that point orphaned, although they didn't know it. And, uh, you know, she, ultimately she and uh, Miriam survived, and I'll tell some more stories about uh, their experience, but when Miriam died in 1993, Eva opened this museum in her memory, which was a place for her to invest those memories and do something productive with all of that stuff that can just kind of, if you don't do something productive with it, it can form a cesspool and then destroy you from the inside out. So um, I write in field notes. I don't know if you guys use these, but field notes are awesome. So I wrote my notes in here. Um, I think that uh, it's important to remember when our star is broken, we aren't really broken. We aren't broken as people, we're wounded. And when you're wounded, what you need to do is heal. Um, I think there are some strategies for dealing with painful memories that I've heard from guys like Henry Oster. You know, Henry is a, um, the last living Jewish survivor from Cologne, Germany. And I talked to Henry, he came and spoke at our museum, and uh, he said that, you know, sometimes when he's just uh, like doing the dishes or he opens up the bottom compartment of the sink, he gets the smell of chlorine from the bleach. And that reminded him of in the camps when somebody died and they would clean the area with bleach. And so then he's right back there in his experiences. And I said, well, Henry, what do you do with those painful memories that pop up and surprise you? And uh, he said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I kind of look at it as an anthropologist. I try and step back and recognize how my brain is functioning. It just, you know, it's this big computer, and it just opened this drawer with this memory in it. The memory came out, and now I can see that's where the memory goes back again. Um, so I think when we're going through a tough time, sometimes if you're able to detach and, and view it as an anthropologist might, just observing, I think that it can help. Um, 
one thing that I realized when I was <laughs> working with Eva, uh, who is an advocate of forgiveness. This is a big thing, like she forgave the Nazis. Who does that? And it caused a lot of controversy. And so she's been struggling to explain to people why she chose to forgive. So she's also sometimes not her best spokesperson because she's really fiery, does not hold her tongue. And so uh, often I would come behind her and try to help explain. And what I realized was that uh, all of that pain and anger lives inside your emotions, right? And the emotions are like this big, wild beast, this wild horse. And your rational brain is the one that can control the horse. It's like the jockey. You know, if you watch uh, horse racing or whatever, you've got these amazingly powerful animals controlled by a very, very small man sitting on the horse's back with a bridle, right? So uh, the animal will be wild. It will be raging perhaps from time to time. But if you can just get the jockey of your rational mind onto the horse, then you can slowly, over time, start to guide uh, that big wild animal so that it doesn't um, overpower you anymore. Um, I think that whenever we suffer these wounds of existence, when we suffer a trauma, we have a choice of how to handle it. It can, um, it can season us, it can tenderize our hearts, or it can make our hearts more leathery and more contracted. And as I age, I hope I become like uh, the survivors that I have had the honor to interact with who have taken their experiences and used them to season their hearts and be more compassionate people who are putting all of that forward to do something good. Um, I think that uh, we need to consider the seeds we're watering in somewhere like in, you know, way, way north Sweden or Russia or whatever, they've got that bank of like all the seeds in the world, you know, just in case there's a nuclear disaster and we need to replant everything. That's kind of how our minds work. We've got all the potential seeds in the world. You know, the people who planned the Holocaust had PhDs and went to school just like you and me. So somewhere along the way, like they weren't born monsters. So different seeds were being watered. Uh, by propaganda and hatred and these sorts of things. That's why it's so important, the media we consume uh, and the way we talk about people, like this new NRA ad. Anytime you hear uh, somebody referring to a big group of people as a they or a them, warning sign, warning sign, big generalizations. Uh, so what you water grows. What you water grows. So if you want to... Um, have the flower of your mind blossom, you've got to water the right seeds, right? Intentionally, you've got to do it intentionally and it won't happen overnight, but maybe you will sow the seeds and water the seeds that will help you overcome this trauma. Um, Chinua Achibe said, suffering should be creative, should give birth to something good and beautiful. Uh, Viktor Frankl said, if you can figure out a why to your suffering, you can overcome almost any how. Um, I think these things, you know, if you can't find meaning in it, make a joke about it. Humor is often the only bridge in the absurd paradox of what happens to us. That's why there are so many amazing Jewish comedians, right? Like Jewish people are constantly under assault and humor is what comes out a lot of times. Um, when you're in the throes of it, have you all heard Andrew Solomon's TED talk? It's like 45 minutes. I don't know how they let him get away with this because TED Talks are supposed to be like 18 minutes, but it's 45 minutes and it's amazing. But he, ha uh, you know, I've struggled with depression and anxiety uh, a lot, as many of you probably have too. And he said something that really unlocked a big uh, realization for me, which is that the opposite of depression is not happiness. The opposite of depression is vitality. Vitality. Uh, so depression and anxiety are two poles on the same spectrum. Depression is when you're suffering from not enough aliveness. Anxiety is when you have too much aliveness than uh, you can handle at this moment. And there are strategies to come back down the other way. Uh, we should ask ourselves, when 
we are traumatized, when we are struggling to overcome something, do I have the right to be happy? Do I have the right to be happy? Do I have the right to enjoy life? Nice, thank you. You've just reaffirmed my faith in humanity. Thank you very much. Um, and when you ask yourself, do I have the right to be happy? People would write to Eva Kaur all the time and say, um, I have been abused physically, sexually, emotionally. Um, I was raped. I was any uh, number of the ways that people suffer. And they always ask her, what can I do? What is the first step? And she always suggested to them, the first step is to ask themselves the question, do I have the right to be happy? So many people are suffering, especially if other loved ones have died in the same trauma. They feel they can't be happy and move on. And she always says, you know, would my mother, would my father, who died in the gas chambers at Auschwitz, want me to carry this baggage for the rest of my life? Would they want me to suffer on their behalf? And she says, no, of course they wouldn't. Any good parents want to see their children happy. So I think that we can all claim the right to be happy, and that's why Eva has arrived at the conclusion of forgiveness. What is forgiveness? I think one of the most compelling definitions of it that I've heard is giving up your right to a better past. Forgiveness is giving up your right to a better past, because you can't change it now. You can't change it now. And I've learned from some of the survivors of the Rwandan genocide in 1994, uh, they have a common refrain that it's not about what you lost, it's about what you're carrying forward. It's not about what you lost, it's about what you're carrying forward. Because if you're not dead right now, you're somewhere in the middle of your story. And you can choose, uh, in some ways, the outcome. We have as many opportunities to reinvent ourselves as there are moments in a day. Marianne Williamson said that. Uh, the question is, how do you want to show up for life? I have a friend named Steve Robert who talks about the joys and sorrows of life. Everything, joys and sorrows, joys and sorrows. Knowing all of this about life, how do you choose to show up? Because we do have a choice. And to exercise choice is like one of the most powerful things that a human animal can feel. So um, forgiveness is not about the perpetrator, says Eva. It's about the survivor's right to be happy. It's about your right to be happy. I'm not saying we all got to forgive. I know um, survivors whose way of overcoming was to be as successful as they could. Sam Harris. Uh, and he said he wanted to prove that he was an American boy when he got here. He was playing baseball. He was going to be a successful businessman, and he did it. That's how he triumphed over the Nazis. Um, <clears throat> some people are still angry. Anger can help you, I think. Some people like it, but it's a volatile fuel, which can easily destroy the bearer, so it's tough. But all of this, forgiveness, the stuff about that, it's driving toward being more open. Because fear is the number one obstacle, I think, to all of us living out the highest versions of ourselves. Fear is also the number one driver of conflict in the world. We're afraid, and so we blame other people. And when we blame other people, we have conflict. And when we have conflict, we have war and destruction. So how we deal with fear is a primary question. That's how I dealt with it this morning, was to show this to you guys and give it to Ty, Ty and pass it around and just put it out there. Um, fear is a state of contraction. Openness helps you expand and be your highest self, to operate on your highest level. How do you feel when you suddenly find yourself walking alone in your own shoes. Do you ever have those moments where you're like just walking along and you're like, holy shit, life is heavy right now. And what are you gonna do about it? You know, a lot of people immediately like pull out their phones, let me search for the next distraction, but can you work with that feeling? Can you let that feeling open you up? Um, can you look into the face of your own fears and do something about it? One of my favorite theologians said the primary conclusion that we have to draw, we don't have to, a lot of people don't, is about reality. Despite all evidence to the contrary, reality, what is, is fundamentally okay. It can be trusted. You can exist and it's okay. 
You don't have to fear. The opposite of fear, I think, is trust. It's not bravery, it's trust. And how you deal with fear is to open up. You intentionally make yourself vulnerable. It's counterintuitive. Saul Williams said, the strongest people in the world are the ones who make themselves vulnerable, who walk into this battlefield with arrows flying and drop their shield and have open hearts to the world. Um, There's some evidence, too, that uh, being open will help you survive a catastrophe. I read an interesting article about uh, plane crashes. And the concept was that people typically have two types of reactions when they know something horrible is imminent. Um, Most people freeze up and get tunnel vision and are not operating with their full mind. There are some people who are somehow able to stay open long enough or deep enough that they can notice that crack in the fuselage that's emitting light and you gotta move toward the light uh, when the plane goes down. Um, So if you are more open, you have a greater chance of perceiving those things that might save your life. If you are more open, you are more lucky. You can see the open doors and the opportunities around you. Uh, There are some more stories about that involving a gorilla costume, but I don't think I have time for that today. Um, The thing about cultivating your openness is that you will bring a high quality of presence to every situation that you're in. My guy Carl Wilkins, who's a Muzungu like me, uh, he's a white person who was in Rwanda during the genocide in 1994, and when all the other Americans were evacuated by the State Department, he chose to stay because he was there on a relief mission, and he said, during this atrocity is when people need us the most. So his wife and their three kids went to Burundi. He stayed behind and helped bring, use his basically use his white privilege to help bring uh, food, water, medicine to orphanages around Rwanda. And now when he goes back to Rwanda, he has all of these adults who come up to him and say, you're Carl Wilkins and you saved my life. What an amazingly enriching thing that must be. Uh, But Carl always has such a high quality of presence that he brings into the room and it's transformative when you are really there and present with people. Uh, Carl tells a story about when the killers came to his gate in Rwanda in 1994. The women from the neighborhood came to the gate to defend him, and they weren't armed with guns or machetes or anything like that. They were armed with stories. And they told these killers, you can't take him. His kids play with our kids. His kids play with our kids, and that is... Uh, You know, Carl says all along, they didn't know it, but his kids were making investments in the hearts of these people, which ended up saving their lives. So let's move on to the collective, shall we? Um, I think the first thing that I learned about surviving as a collective movement was from uh, one of my favorite people, Reverend William Barber, who is the founder of Moral Mondays in North Carolina, which is becoming a national movement. And there's an organization started up here in Indianapolis. I don't know if Mike Olis is here, but Mike is running that show. Um, And when Reverend Barber came into the room, before him came um, a woman who led songs. And then uh, Reverend came up and talked about how important the music of the movement is. Um, You don't, I mean, I spend like half my life Uh, walking around listening for good music and like being in stores and using SoundHound to figure out what that song is. Music is so important to me as I'm working with all these tough stories just to keep my spirit going. And to have joy in spite of, to have joy in spite of something is one of the most radical things you can do because you're reclaiming the power over your mind, body, and spirit. That's what funk music was all about, right? This was George Clinton talking to a marginalized audience in a time of great social upheaval. And the message was, free your mind and your ass will follow. Which I think is good advice. He called uh, funk music the prune juice of the mind. You know, you get your body moving. Like, find the space inside of you that is still free and rock what you got. Uh, So I 
like I seriously really enjoy funk music and recommend it prescriptively. Um, the mythology of P-Funk uh, is pretty interesting too. The, one of the main villains is this guy named Sir Nose, Sir Nose devoid of funk. And Sir Nose always refuses to dance. He will not dance. He is part of the syndrome, the syndrome that sucks out your joy and steals your funk. So when we look at certain politicians, which may give us trouble, uh, these guys are the syndrome, man. They're the syndrome. And the solution to the syndrome is uh, it comes from one of my favorite songs, Endangered Species, Bop Gun. When the syndrome is around, don't let your guard down. All you got to do is call on the funk. And the, the idea was to shoot these unfunky people, not with bullets, but with funk, with bop and get their bodies moving, right? So we can't let a person like Donald Trump dictate how we're gonna feel in a day. We cannot let politicians steal our joy. We've gotta have joy in spite of. Can you imagine how radical it would be when somebody's trying to destroy you to say, you're not gonna take away my joy, I'm gonna be happy instead. So having joy in spite of. Uh, another thing that I've learned from Eva Kaur is to have that promised land vision. You've got to have a vision for yourself that is higher than the circumstances you find yourself in in order to survive. Eva says, even as a 10-year-old girl, she knew that it was survival time. And she held this vision in her mind of her and her twin sister Miriam walking out of the gates, holding hands, alive and free. And so they were in Auschwitz, January 27th, 1945. They were liberated, and you can find this picture online. Probably if you go to the Candles website, it's right there. Eva and Miriam, two 10-year-old girls, holding hands, walking through the gates. She held on to that vision for her entire time in Auschwitz. And of course, we know about uh, the Israelites. We know about the civil rights movement and all of the talk about the promised land. Uh, brothers and sisters, envisioning, envisioning. I think this is one of the main problems of why um, progressive folks like me have had a tough time in uh, elections is because we aren't putting forth a vision. We're always talking about what we aren't and what we're against. We've got to talk about what we're for, a pro-social movement, right? We've got to envision it. How does that look like? How do we build it? Um, Keep your eyes on the prize, right? Keep your eyes on the prize. I believe that we are here to create heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. And you don't have to be a theist um, to subscribe to that theory. Like, you know, my whole thing with religion is I've ultimately realized I don't care what you believe. What matters is your practice. Like, I believe crazy stuff like Terrence McKenna theories and aliens and things like that. But, like, I'm still out here trying to do good and not brag about it. And so if you subscribe to one religion or another, that's cool. I don't care. What's your practice look like? And I personally believe that this dude, Jesus, who was apparently like that friend you uh, text a whole bunch and like, you know, he shows up once for every 20 times you invite him. But when he does, man, he's on fire. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that Jesus was trying to sell us afterlife insurance. I think that he was always saying the kingdom of, a, kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is here. It is right now. We are making it. We're doing it. That's why he was executed, right? You don't get executed for having some neat ideas about the afterlife. You get executed for trying to shake up the social order. And that's, that's where social justice comes from. Justice, Marcus Borg said, is the social form of love. That's why we talk about social justice. That's what I believe in. That's what I'm trying to do. So... Um, and I think that's what a lot of us are trying to do, too. So the idea is that even though it's difficult, even though people are dropping like flies, there's always a remnant moving forward with the work. In Hebrew mythology, in not just mythology, but historical literature, there's always a remnant. Small fraction of the people who have survived trying to keep the work going forward. So don't worry. If you feel like you're out there alone, there are other people who are part of that remnant, and please don't give up. Because if you give up, like you might be the last person holding the earth on its axis. And if you give up, everything's going to end. Um, but connect with your network. 
and survive with your remnant. I think that creation never ended. Creation never ended. Go back to like whatever creation story you subscribe to. It never ended. It's going on and we are part of it. We can choose. The way the world is is not the way it has to be or the way it always will be. We choose moment by moment what type of world we want this to be. So carve out your own vision. How difficult is it to carve out your own vision and hold to it when it seems like the entire world is trying to get you to come down from that vision? Scale down, scale down, don't be so crazy. No, the answer is to be weird. Be so weird, man. Culture is not your friend in this instance. Uh, you gotta hold on to that vision because you're the only one who has it. Nobody's ever gonna have your particular vision again. So please don't give up on your vision. Uh, that's why they call it being countercultural. And then if we're talking about surviving as a movement, we've got to talk about resistance. One of the interesting theories about the Holocaust, okay, so the typical theory about the Holocaust is that uh, civilization normally has civilizing effects on people. If not for civilization, we'd all be like wild animals shooting and killing and pillaging and stuff like that. And thanks to society, we're like nice to each other. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman, who's a Polish sociologist, turned that theory on its head. Uh, he said, instead of the Holocaust being a disruption in the normalizing, si normally civilizing effects of society, the Holocaust represents the peak of what society can do to us because society is dehumanizing. Like industrial, post-industrial society is driving toward automation. It's driving toward making humans more like automatons. So to resist the syndrome, the answer is to be human. Stay human. Stay human. What does it mean to stay human? It means to feel everything. Don't shut off your feelings. Feel everything. And like work it out with funk music if you need to, but feel it. Be messy. Be a walking catastrophe. Be, uh, be open. Connect with people. We will die if we don't have enough connection in our lives. Like if you leave a baby without connecting with other humans, it will die. Not just from lack of nutrients, it will die from lack of connection. Separation is an illusion, I feel. Uh, so I wanted to um, tell one small story about staying human, which comes from Eva Kaur's husband, Mickey Kaur, who's also a Holocaust survivor. And when he and his family were sent to the ghetto in Riga, Latvia, uh, you know, they couldn't take much. They didn't know what they were packing for, but his mother made sure to bring a tablecloth. And when they were in the ghetto, squalor, you know, rats, fleas, whatever, every night she would take a wooden crate, put the tablecloth on it, and serve whatever dinner they had on the tablecloth. This tablecloth for her was a form of resistance. It was about staying human, even though they're trying to make us less human, even though they're trying to shave our heads and make us into a number. Stay human, stay human. And I wanted to close, I, I really wanna to talk to you guys uh, with some questions and stuff like that, so I just wanted to close with a quote from a woman named Eddie Hillisom. Eddie Hillisom was a Jewish woman who died in Auschwitz at age 29 in 1943, but she did a lot of writing and her diaries survived. And this is a quote that is just so central to me as I look at the world today and I see all that's going on and I feel frustrated, I feel hopeless, whatever I read this. She says, the misery here is quite terrible and yet late at night when the day has slunk away into the depths behind me, I often walk with a spring in my step along the barbed wire and then, time and again, it soars straight from my heart. I can't help it. That's just the way it is, like some elementary force, the feeling that life is glorious and magnificent, and that one day we shall be building a whole new world. One day we shall be building a whole new world. And against every new outrage and every fresh horror, we must, we shall put up one more piece of love and goodness, drawing strength from within ourselves. We may suffer, but we must not succumb. Thank you.